Nate Ort is an agronomy specialist and crop physiologist with the Canola Council of Canada. And in 2021, Nate completed a master's of science in plant science at the University of Manitoba. Nate and I work together and uh, it's pretty clear in working with him that uh, he's passionate about using science and research findings to promote best management practices and to explore research, creativity and innovation to tackle agricultural challenges. Here's Nate. Hey, <clears throat> hey, thanks, Jay. I'm assuming that you can see my screen okay? Yep, looks good, Nate. And your, your audio is good so far, so you can keep your video on. Oh, okay, cool. You all get to look at me as well. Okay, so my segment uh, of today's uh, webinar is looking at uh, tracking canola phenology, genetics, environment, and management, finding room for improvement. So what is phenology? Phenology is the study of life cycle events or growth stage timing um, and the external or uh, the external influences, either biotic or abiotic that might affect this. So, you know, as you can imagine uh, in the spring, we plant uh, and then it comes out of the ground, but what really is driving this rate of growth and development? And from, from seed to emergence, this is like, this is mostly soil temperature, soil moisture, um, but there, you know, there could be some management practices in there as well that also affect this. Uh, and you know, progressing through uh, the life cycle of canola from emergence to, you know, let's say flowering, uh, the example on the screen, what else drives, you know, what can drive phenology then? So we have air temperature, soil temperature, precipitation, or you know, the amount of available uh, soil moisture, um, but also things like photo period, the length of day, or or the amount of solar radiation. And, and these, of course, all interact with each other. Um, and so it's just incredibly complex. Um, but, and, and you know, to further even to add on to this, different factors affect the rate of growth and development differently. And it, and it depends on the growth stage that it's in too. Uh, so this kind of goes for most, most crop species, but the optimal temperatures for, for max growth rate and development uh, is usually warmer when the plant is in the vegetative stage and lower when the plant is developing reproductively. You know, so as you can imagine, uh, when I was younger, I preferred warmer temperatures. Uh, and now that I'm a little bit older, uh, and mostly because of my current hairstyle, I prefer cooler temperatures because these cooler temperatures mean that there is either less sun or I'm in the shade uh, and I'm not going to burn my head. Uh, or I can wear a hat, but I don't often think of that. So phenology, back to G by E by M, which drives yield and, and, but which drives yield the most, you know, do they impact production the same consistently or is it different? Uh, the genetics that are commercially available now are, are good. You know, there are good hybrids uh, available, um, you know, and management is good too. We're good at our jobs. Farmers are good at their jobs. Agronomists are good at their jobs. We do research all the time to try to improve this. And, and, you know, and I think genetics and management, uh, we do a really good job of. Um, in my opinion, environment drives yield the most. And I think that 2021 growing season is a really good example of this. Uh, you know, you can have the best genetics, you can, you can do everything right management wise, but you know, if it doesn't rain. So I'm going to be talking a lot about environment too, um, and, and kind of a, an exercise that Canola Council agronomy specialists uh, participated in this year. So I'm going to be talking about tracking phenology and how you might be able to make this work uh, for you and, and how we can maybe find rooms for improvement just by looking at growth stages and, and when these occurred. So in, in 2021, Canola Council Agronomy Specialists recorded growth stages for the same hybrid through the growing season. Uh, so here's, you know, the sheet here. This is, we just went out to the field at least once a week and you'd write down the calendar date of all these stages. The environmental conditions and the management practices, uh, of course, varied. These were approximately where the fields are, right? So I, I've been calling this the CPNI or the Agronomy Specialist Farm, <laughs> but it's just it's that's a big farm, right? Big. It's Western Canada, and most farms don't farm in all three provinces. But so you know, keep that in mind. Um, but but this exercise, it was it was a good uh, way to you know summarize uh, the growing season. So again, yeah, of course, environment was different. Uh, these two charts that I have, uh, the one on top, that's accumulated growing degree days uh, starting on May 1st and ending at the end of September. Uh, you can see, if you're, if you're looking closely, we're not going to get too far into this, but the purple line and the green line, those are Manitoba, they accumulated the most. And, 
and, and so on and so forth. And below it is precipitation uh, or rain for the, for the same interval. Um, and, and what I didn't show here is actually all of these locations compared to their climate normal. Uh, so, you know, the normal growing conditions for, for a given location uh, based on a 30 year average. Uh, for heat, all locations were above normal. So it was hotter than normal. For precipitation, all locations were lower than normal. So it was hot and dry. I think we all knew that already. Diving into the results. So from planting to emergence, and, and if you see this, this figure here on, uh, on your right, if you imagine planting at the start of this bar and emergence at the end of the bar, uh, a timeline of sorts, if you will, uh, and the value in the middle, that's the number of days, right? So why, obviously some of these fields emerged a little bit quicker than others. This one here, that was my field. Uh, took two weeks, and and why could this be? And so you know when you have the when you have these data, you can start looking for trends. And and again, this is looking at the you know environment drove all of these differences. But imagine if you know you're lucky you you decide I'm going to plant later this year. How did that affect time to emergence? Or I'm going to grow a different variety? Or I'm going to seed lighter or heavier? Or maybe you have an on farm trial and you have a bunch of different comparisons that you need to make. Uh, tracking phenology can, can really provide a lot of useful data. One thing I noticed with our data set was these fields that emerged quicker uh, were all planted after May 15th, a trend. Another trend that I noticed was uh, the average temperature 10 days before seeding, as this increased, the days to emergence decreased. So in this case, planting in, warm, uh, in warmer, uh, later spring, uh, this this hasten the time from planting to emergence. Uh, of course, planting uh, later isn't always possible. Uh, you know, we have more than one crop to plant. We have a lot of ground to cover in a relatively short window of time. But, you know, increasing that time from planting to emergence, this can have a lot of benefits. Um, and, and this can lead to uniformity in the plant stand. Uh, things like uh, insecticide seed treatments, you know, these, these don't last forever. So let's get the plant up and out of the ground as quickly as possible. What about early season growth? So I have days from planting here uh, and, and the vegetative development emergence, you know, uh, cotyledon through to bolting. And you can see that this was different uh, among the fields that we observed. It, it would be great if this line was actually more flat because that would mean that canola just raced through those growth stages. And that's important for flea beetles as well too, right? Like if we can all grow it, great. Um, and then when I looked at the average number of days and stage among these fields, you know, there were some that were that were quicker. This one in Saskatchewan uh, was growing faster and same with Alberta. And again, this this will be largely due to environment. But, you know, if you can imagine, say these are all different hybrids on your farm, say it's a side by side trial. Why, you know, why are some doing more than others? Is, how do we increase early season growth rate? Can we do this through selecting hybrids? Do we plant earlier or later seeding rate pest management? What about fertilizer placement or pop up? Uh, phosphorus effect with when you when you put uh, you know C place fertilizer C place phosphorus. It's a tongue twister for a plant scientist. What about phenology? Uh, sorry, flowering. Uh, so the duration of flowering, we you know we always hear more more time in flower can mean greater yield, and and that was actually observed in, in the fields that we uh, looked at this summer. So you know as as the duration of flowering increased, uh, so did yield. So how do we get canola to flower for longer? Do we plant earlier? Do we try to shift that you know, window into maybe cooler temperatures, would that help? Uh, do we plant later? Um, does this have to do with hybrids? What about seeding rates? Um, it's, you know what, you're gonna end up, I'm gonna have more questions than answers. I'm more of a question guy. I don't, I don't really have a lot of answers, so. Flowering, heat stress, widespread across the prairies this year. Uh, you know, temperatures above 30 degrees during flowering, uh, this, this can lead to yield loss. And, and so uh, what I looked at in this data set was a percent of flowering days above 30 degrees. So imagine, you know, your canola crop flowered for 20 days, uh, 10 of those days were above 30 degrees. That means that 50% of the flowering days were pretty hot uh, and that sucks. So it was, but like, so what does that mean? Um, in, in this data set, what, what I noticed was when this percent of flowering days uh, was greater, days in flower was shorter. So high temperatures during flowering can lead to a shorter flowering duration. And these, of course, the shorter flowering duration and also the heat stress will lead to reduced yield. 
So which hybrids on your farm flower the longest? I think this is, this is a good uh, and an important uh, part of data to collect for hybrid comparison trials. If you have you know, two or three or however many you choose to compare, tracking when flowering starts. Uh, and, and actually these heat stress, most experiments, they, they, uh, they consider flowering from bolting. So you know, even actually before there's, you, there's visible flowers, but bolting to the end of flower. Um, and, and which are the first ones to flower and, and why is this? Moving forward to pod and seed development, something that, uh, that I noticed in, in, our, in these fields was when days from bolting to 60% seed color change, the recommended timing for, for swathing, uh, when, the, when this increased, so did yield. You know, so do some hybrids spend more time in reproductive development uh, than others? And, and you know, this is something that life science companies and canola breeders are probably selecting for already, but you know, I would encourage, I would encourage you to, to look at this on your farm and, and maybe you'll notice differences among your hybrids or, or management practices or whatever. When you look at you know, the whole, the big picture of, of what happened uh, for us in the fields that we observed, this is kind of the timeline. So planting, emergence, flowering starts here or bolting, end of flowering, and then you know, reproductive development. And um, this is, yeah, so this is what it looks like over the growing season. Um, and it gives you a snapshot of, you know, Look, this field, this field was planted later uh, and it matured later. Well, that makes sense. But this, this field here was planted, well, it wasn't the first one planted, but it wasn't the last. And it was actually the second last mature. So, you know, when you start, when you start recording these things, you can, you can look back and look at the environmental conditions, maybe during that time or what have you. You know, and, and so you can do this too. Uh, this, this, actually, this form is actually on our website at, at this link here at, at the bottom of the page. Scroll all the way down to the bottom. Um, and I think it's a really good tool that you can use to evaluate genetics or management um, and genetics by management. Of course, there's a, there will be interactions between those two. Uh, things like hybrid selection, so maturity or early season vigor or growth rate, maybe the duration of flowering. Uh, what about a fertilizer experiment? Uh, you know, the starter pea and early season vigor, are those plants popping up out of the ground? You know, record this data. Um, I don't I, don't, I always cringe whenever I see early, you know early season vigor data as a scale. I want to see I want to see this. When did these stages occur? You know how big is the plant? Pull out the plant, weigh it, measure it. Don't give me a rating. Uh, what about planting conditions? Do you go later? Do you go earlier? That you can do that for this too. You know and 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 so like I said before, probably more questions in this presentation than answers. Uh, um, but you know I think uh, that's that's one of the best parts about my job is I get to ask a lot of questions. Thanks, Jay. Right on. Thanks, Nate.